Welcome back to our non-toxic podcast. It is officially episode 91, which is cuckoo bananas, but it's going to be a very fun, hopefully helpful, introspective episode, largely due to you guys submitting the most hard-hitting, deep questions. So thank you for that. It could have gone either way when we do an advice episode. It could have been super silly, girly fun, or it can be existential. And you guys obviously are feeling existential. So thank you to everybody who wrote in. It's going to be a fun one. It is a little challenging to get into this headspace at 7 a.m., but for you guys, I will do it. I will do anything. I have four shots of espresso in the Monstera to help me out, so I think somehow I can get through it. Um, First and foremost, I want to address my outfit. It's a little witchy, a little Fleetwood Mac inspired. This necklace in particular, this watch, always makes me feel as though I have um, some kind of curse on me, not because it makes me feel bad. It's just that I found this in an antique store and it's so unique that I always tend to think that things that I find secondhand or in these vintage stores contain some kind of curse just independently of anything that they do or present. But this one specifically, it just feels like it has some kind of lore that I haven't discovered yet. And the outfit, the long dress, the little shirt that I thrifted, it was $2. I got it on Saturday. All of this is just feeling a little witchy. Plus, look at these shoes. Oh, that's not a, that's not a good foot angle. Look at look at my little loafers. These just, yeah, I didn't really realize it until I left for the day. And then I was thinking, I look kind of medieval, but that's all right. It happens to the best of us. Um, next, I am breaking out, and that's so fun for me. The cool thing is that I'm at the age where I have a deep set wrinkle that I have to get Botox for, but I also keep breaking out. You would think that life would demand you to have one or the other. You're either young enough to have acne or you're old enough to have wrinkles. Not me. I've always been somewhat of an overachiever. I have both. So I'm loving that journey for myself. In other good news, I had a recall on my car. If anyone else drives a Ford Explorer, you know the plight that is our life because they're great cars. I can't complain because mine kept me very safe in an accident that I was in last year, but there's something recalled like every other month, it seems. At this point, I'm like, can we just stop looking for things to fix? (laughs) I don't really know how they discover the need for recalls. I'm sure it's something more along the lines of like accidents keep happening, so they have to investigate, but I don't want to know anymore. I'm tired of dropping my car off. I'm tired of having it gone. There was an alert. Usually I ignore them. I'm going to be honest. Now at this point, the things that come in, I'm like, this is not necessary. I'll like evaluate it do a little risk risk analysis in my tiny pea brain and then decide if it's worth me being without my car for three hours. Most of the time it's not. But this time they actually called me and most of, it's like a letter nine times out of 10. This time the Ford dealership called me and they said, hey, there's been a recall. You need to bring your car in. I said, what's the problem? They said there's something in the engine, something or other, blah, 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 and it can cause your car to crash. I said, oh, okay. That seems like something that I actually should address. So unfortunately I had to take my car in. They couldn't fix it. Even though I booked the appointment like two weeks in advance, they had to order a part. But then whenever I got back to pick up my car with the understanding that I would then return again to get it actually fixed, they said, yes, and you will be needing four new tires. Also amazing because tires are so expensive and (laughs) I don't know if you've been following along closely to my journey, but we've just had one expensive thing after the other. Roof leak, brakes went out in my car, air conditioning, fridge, my ring lost the diamond, and I need new tires. And to be fair, this wasn't like an upsell situation. They showed me the photo whenever they take like the little gauge and they dip it into your tires to see how deep the grooves are to tell you like at, at what safety level you're falling. And he couldn't even dip it in. He was like setting it on top. He's like, yeah, you see how your grooves aren't? I said, yeah, I see what you mean. So unfortunately I will be moving forward with new tires due to my desire to continue living. (sighs) But that'll be so great for me. And most of the time I like to thrift because it's fun and it's like a little scavenger hunt and I can find unique pieces. But it seems that these days I just have to thrift because the universe is going to take every last cent that I have if I don't. So we're going to be frugal. We're going to ball on a budget for a while and that's going to be okay. As a matter of fact, everything I'm wearing is thrifted. This little watch, it's kind of ugly if you look at it up close, but I think that's why I bought it. This was $2. It was at a thrift store in Nixa 
And I don't know if you can see on the face, all of the numbers are like in crazy little Alice in Wonderland font and they're all rainbow colors, which I thought was funny because the watch is like a basic black watch. This shirt, half off half, got it this weekend. I got a whole, not a whole haul, it was like four or five things. And I almost made a video, but I had just posted a video of my previous thrift haul and I said, I have to cut back. People are gonna think I'm crazy and that's not something I'm ready to reveal yet. So I do have all the stuff set aside. I will film it and I will post it, but I'm trying to space these things out so you people don't get sick of seeing my face. But it was a good little haul. I did not spend that much. I spent 45, 50 bucks and I got a lot of cute stuff. So, and one of those things was a pair of shoes for $20, which is usually more than I would spend on one singular thrift item. Typically I like to buy things that are $15 or less, even 10 if I can swing it. But sometimes like these shoes were perfect. Again, they'd never been worn. They're so cute. I will wear them all the time. I had to splurge. But in this economy, you know, sometimes you have to spend $20 on shoes at the thrift store. This dress, I don't remember where I got it, but I know that it was thrifted at some point. It's really cute, but it's like very low cut. It has like a cowl neck in the front. That's why if I'm going to wear it to something that's not an evening event, say a 7 a.m. podcast recording, I would throw something over it. Hence the shirt that I have on right now. And then these shoes, they're not thrifted, but they are from my girl Janessa's garage sale. And I will forever be grateful for her cleaning her closet. <laughs> Anyways... <sighs> All of that was completely unnecessary information. Next, um, updates on my healthy eating and my cutting back on sugar. Like I said, this is the mom's Sarah. <laughs> this is not um, the epitome of health, but also I have been cutting sugar out as much as possible while still maintaining a normal lifestyle. And you guys have heard me talk about health and fitness before, but I feel like if I do something that's not sustainable, I won't sustain it. Wouldn't you know it? So for me, Dialing back the sugar is realistic. Cutting out sugar is not realistic. So I still will have a sugary coffee every now and then if I feel it. These really aren't bad. These are just oat milk, four shots of espresso, and whatever syrup you get. It's not crazy. However, I do add cold foam, <laughs> which makes it crazy. But listen, if I'm going to go for it, I'm going to go for it. Every other day, I've been having plain oat milk lattes. And because I'm not doing this for like a, an aesthetic purpose or a weight loss purpose, then I think it's okay to have some sugar every now and then. But it is crazy how quick your taste buds adapt from my sugar-saturated diet to now being like, I have this drink. I'm like, ooh, it's like a milkshake, which I do love first thing in the morning. But it is crazy how desensitized I had become to my sugar consumption. Fast forward to now, realizing that whenever I take a sip of these things after my eyes have been opened. So there's not currently any candy in my house, which is going to change because the Reese's pumpkins are coming out. So I'm going to stock up on those at Sam's and get the 58 pound bag. Like I'm a horse that can only eat these Reese's eggs out of this giant trough. But other than that, there's no crazy candy in my house. And that's a good thing for me because I am a like handful at a time kind of person. So the bags will kind of just like sit open in my candy shelf. There's a whole shelf of the pantry and I'll just go in and like get a, get a little handful here and then get a handful here and then get a handful here. And the next thing I know, I've had 27 handfuls a day of candy. So like I said, it's probably best that I stop doing that. Otherwise, the red 40 dye in all of my nurse clusters is going to make me start emitting a red glow. And I don't think that would go with my hair color at this time. <sighs> so healthy eating is going, okay. <laughs> the hardest part for me is figuring out how to get enough protein because it's not that I'm trying to cut things out necessarily. It's cut back sugar and then really hone in on how much protein I need to be eating. And alongside that, trying to sleep more, which has been something that I really have always struggled with. And that's such a dumb thing to say. Because to say I struggle to sleep as someone who doesn't have young children and I don't have a job that works in the evenings and everything else, it's such a dumb thing that I've never slept well. Even as a kid, like I just have not liked to nap or liked to sleep and it's always been a struggle of mine. I'm always up late, up early, every single sleepover or every single girl's trip or any trip I've ever been at, I'm always the first person up. And it's not even in a way where I pop out of bed and I'm like, let's go for a jog. It's just, I can't sleep. I'm always up. And if I could omit the need to sleep, entirely from my life, I think that I absolutely would do it because I like to be awake and I like to be doing activities and doing other stuff. And there's already not, not enough time in the day to do everything that I want to do, but sleep has just always evaded me. So I've been trying to focus on like reading and no screen time and getting to bed and breathing exercises. And you would think that I have to perform like an entire ritual just to get to sleep with like putting my phone away an hour before bed and not eating before bed. And maybe that's just like a basic <laughs> instinct to not do those things if you're trying to have a good night's sleep. Fan, light off, everything, calm down. What is that when you breathe through your belly? It's supposed to be good for you. I don't know. Breathing exercises, go to sleep. Like it's so difficult for me 
but I have been hitting my sleep goal. Thanks to my aura ring. I have been working on it last night. I almost had a heart attack because I woke up and if you don't have an aura ring, there's like little sensors on the inside of your ring and one of them is green and one of them is red. They take your temperature and your heart rate respectively. I don't know which is which, but last night I woke up and this has happened to me more than I would like to admit since I got the ring like three weeks ago, but I looked at my hand and the ring, the sensor lights are so bright. They shine like through your finger. It's not like just if you look at your palm, you can see the light coming out of the sides of the band on your palm it shined through my flesh and bones. So I'm looking at my hand and I can just see through my finger and I was kind of taken aback at three in the morning, which I'm kind of skittish at 3 a.m. anyways, but that's neither here nor there. Anyways, I'm on my health grind. I found some pasta at Walmart, which I'm not going to remember to link, but if you guys are curious and you message me, I will send you a photo of it. But from the time it takes me to take this, do all my meetings for the day, go home, edit, I'm not going to remember it. But it was really good pasta. It's just like spiral rotini looking pasta. And it has a crazy amount of protein and fiber. And usually those things are not as good as you want them to be. You can just tolerate them because they're healthy for you. These were actually really good. And maybe it had something to do with the fact that my husband prepared the pasta for me and I didn't have to do it, but it was really good. So I highly recommend that. It's just little things that you can do. For me, like Greek yogurt, non-flavored, tastes a lot like sour cream. So I'll put that on my avocado toast or I'll put that in my veggie pasta, which is like another... Anything that emulates pasta, I can usually eat. <laughs> so whenever I have to start eating chicken, then I'm really going to tap out. But all the respect for people who can do chicken and rice, it's just not for me. I I would quit in a day. So you have all my flowers, all my kudos. Moving right along. I had the coolest experience last week, I think, which I might have to find the photo because I put this note in. It's been a while since I recorded a solo episode because I had an episode a couple weeks ago and then we had Sydney's episode, which was amazing. If you haven't listened to it, I highly, highly recommend it. I have a few more guests that I want to have on in the same vein of breast cancer survivors and doctors and everything else. So you have to stay tuned for that. But for now, go listen to her episode. It was really great. So I've been kind of accumulating these notes since then. Okay. Hello guys. I ended up pausing the episode because I had to search for the photo that I put in my own notes to reference and then didn't include. So I guess I had overestimated my ability to remember everything, but this is something that I could give you the gist, but I want to actually like read it verbatim to you so you can get the full, the full picture of what I was experiencing in this moment. So picture this, you guys know what's been going on in my life for the most part for the past year, almost two years, which is nuts, but you know what I've been dealing with, you know what I've been praying for and what I've been struggling with and my thought process and the entire thing and just where I've been at mentally this whole time. So I have really been focusing, as I said last week or last solo episode, just putting everything in a box because life is too short to not be grateful. And I've been so abundantly blessed that to focus on the things that I don't have or the prayers that are not answered feels like a waste of the time and the blessings that I've been given. So my whole philosophy has been putting things in a box, healthy version. So that's that's kind of just how I've been moving and grooving mentally. Not thinking about things that are making me sad, not thinking about prayers I haven't answered, not thinking about anything that's not a blessing that I have because there's so many of those to fixate on. So my whole journal process lately, everything I've been saying has just been focused on, I'm going to be happy now. I'm not going to focus on improving this or growing this or pushing this, just being happy now. And one of the Bible verses that I had kind of been studying and then a couple different Bible studies, like basically all these positive things that I've been consuming we're leading back to God is not going to bless you with more until you're happy with what you have or until you do justice to what you have. And, you know, I never want to put words in God's mouth and say, oh, this is the checklist. Like I have to do this and then he'll reward me. Like it doesn't ever work that way. So I try to avoid those kinds of thinking. And I saw something last night where a girl was saying, oh, this is the prayer. Like you have to be very dangerous or <laughs> let me restart. You have to be very careful when you pray this prayer because God will give you what you want. If you say something in Jesus name and you speak it into the world, you're going to get that thing. So you have to be very careful what you say. And while I'm not a theologian, I'm not somebody that can come out and say like, this is the exact formula to get a prayer answered. I just don't subscribe to that belief that God is like a request box where if you submit your request according to these parameters, he stamps it approved and your prayer gets answered. I just don't think it's that simple. And that's very reductive to everyone who's had prayers answered for healing or for growth or for, you know, any kind of sa saving what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> any kind of rescue, anything to just say, oh, well, you just didn't pray this prayer because you have to be careful if you're going to pray this prayer, God will answer it automatically. I'm getting off track. That's an aside. However, 
my whole thing has been just trying to focus on contentment now because you never know when your prayers will get answered. And when that time comes, I don't want to look back on my life and think, oh my gosh, I spent the, the past 11 months, the past four years, the past 20 years, whatever it is, perseverating on only what was wrong because then you've lost all that time and you can never get it back. So that's been my whole gist lately of life is trying to focus on being happy with what I have. And I was leaving the gym a couple weeks ago and I looked down and there was a little slip of paper on the ground. Keep in mind, there's no Chinese food restaurant anywhere near my gym at all. It's a little fortune. So I bend down, I pick it up and I am such a believer in signs. I think I pray for signs. I see them everywhere. I think that signs are one of God's favorite ways to communicate with me specifically. So I look down and the fortune says, and I quote, now and then it's good to pause in our pursuit of happiness and just be happy. Wow, that was so good. I saw that and I got chills almost immediately. Sent it in my family group chat, of course. It was just something that I felt so clearly was being spoken to me. And I felt validated and everything that I'm feeling. And, you know, sometimes you just need these moments to remember that you're not forgotten. And just because you're in a season of waiting or you're, you know, you feel like God is silent and it's easy to be angry or to feel abandoned, which I have. And I, I do want to plan a whole episode based on being angry at God. It's just such a delicate thing that I don't want to do without doing justice. So I'm kind of waiting until I get older and wiser before I can ac- adequately speak on that. Man, I'm kind of struggling today. I'm so sorry, guys. Maybe I should get further into this coffee before I podcast, but I can't because we don't have the time. It's a very busy day. Let me take a sip. Maybe it'll revive me. Anyways, so the fortune just felt like it was a sign where God was speaking to me and reminding me, you know, you're not forgotten. Your prayers are not falling on deaf ears, but pause this whole pursuit of happiness. Pause everything that you're trying to do to fill the void. Pause everything that you think is going to make you happy. Pause saying, I will be happy when, or whenever all this is answered, then I'll be good. Everything will be fine and just be happy now. And I think that that's one of the best survival strategies that I can give to anyone, to myself included, is that if you have the ability to be happy right now, no matter what right now looks like for you, you will always be okay. And I've had horrible circumstances. I've had situations, you know, that I, I genuinely felt like I couldn't be happy again. I've had situations that I knew would pass, but you still struggle to be happy in the moment. And I think that if you can hone in on your ability to find happiness, no matter where you are, no matter how small it may be, then that's the best strategy that I can tell you to continue to keep going. But I really hope that made sense because I wanted to talk about that for weeks and I don't want it to have just been something that I fumbled over. I probably did. doesn't matter. This is my podcast. This is not the Today Show. You guys don't expect high production value. And for that, I applaud you. Report. We're going to zoom through this so I can get to the advice. What am I reading? I just finished Assassin's Blade last night. Very good. For those of you who read fantasy books, I read Assassin's Blade 3rd. I said that on a different episode. I don't want to bore you, but I started to read it a few weeks back before I read the first two books, Throne of Glass and Crown of Midnight. And now that I have read the prequel in the third slot in the series, I can't even imagine reading it first. I started to read it a few weeks ago, a few months ago, whatever, and I just couldn't get into it. And I thought it was because I just didn't have, I needed to take a beat and cleanse my palate with a different book, i.e. fan fiction, something that wasn't so serious before I got back into a whole new world of of world building and characters and lore and everything else. And it turns out it's just because you don't care about the characters enough to read those prequels until you read the other books because the rest of the series, at least what I've read so far, which is only three books, they're more plot driven and you just, they're more like of a story being told. Whereas the first book chronologically, it's more of novellas. It's kind of like little parables. Like they tell these stories, but you're learning about this main character throughout them. Again, Half you guys probably don't care, (laughs) but the whole point that I'm trying to make is that it was very good. I'm so excited. I ordered all the rest of the books, um, at midnight a few weeks ago, whenever I finished crown of midnight. So I was like, I have to have these. I cannot wait for Barnes Noble in the morning. I have to have them right now. So I Amazon ordered them They're at my doorstep. I have the entire series. I'm ready to devour them. So reading, I think it's called queen of queen of, uh, fire. I don't know. I'm reading the fourth book of the series. I just started last night. So bear with me. Eating. (sighs) Protein, unfortunately. Anyways, playing. What have I been playing a lot of? Still pop music. I feel like there's a new thing I've been listening to. Um, This morning I was listening to the Cars radio, um, not to be confused with the Cars soundtrack based on the Disney original motion picture Cars. 
I mean, the Cars, the band from the 70s, very good. And I was just feeling nostalgic because that was one of my most played bands and radio stations this time last year. And it's crazy how when you listen to music, it's almost like you can imbue your emotions and your feelings and your just your whole state of being at that point in time into the music that you listen to. And for me, it's more potent because I listen to the same eight songs over and over for like a month. Then I move on. So it reminds me very, very specifically of that time. It's not like I have the same favorite songs for years. But unless we're talking about Beverly Hills by Weezer, in which case that's been on my top 100 songs for like five years. But other than that, songs do not transcend life stages with me. So listening to that same playlist, it just transports me immediately back to last year. And last year was so busy and so chaotic, but it was so fun. And I feel like I experienced so much growth, but it is just funny. So I've been feeling nostalgic listening to The Cars. Obsessing? Oh, Jerry Duty. My husband and I started watching that show on Amazon Prime, Jerry Duty, and it's so good. It's like, uh, it's it's filmed almost like The Office. A million people have rec- recommended me to watch this. I just have not gotten around to it, and we finally are at a loss with what shows to dig into because we did not finish Mad Men. I tapped out on that one. I'm, and I like serious shows, but that one for some reason just lost me. Um, I would love to say it's because of the poor treatment of women and the lack of fidelity within a marriage, but I also, it wasn't that. It's just that the episodes bored me. And I feel like that makes me somehow less cultured than the rest of society because everybody loves Mad Men and loves to say that it's like one of the most critically acclaimed shows of all time, which it is. I just don't get the appeal. It was not good. All they do every episode is sit in their office and drink and smoke and cheat on their wives. And maybe it will get better. We only got through season two, but I was like, I can't do this every night. This is like bumming me out and it's stressful. Give me something that I can giggle at. I need to, I need to chuckle before I go into my 18 part bedtime routine. Otherwise I'm going to be up all night. And if I don't get to my minimum giggle quota, then I have to get on TikTok and then I'm going to be up until 3 a.m. And then it's just the night is shot and my sleep score is going to be bad and Aura's is going to yell at me and it's a whole thing. And I can't get into all that. So I can't watch Mad Men. I'm so sorry, Don Draper. Anyways, we couldn't find a show that we liked. So we decided that after the Olympics, we would watch Jury Duty because everyone says it's so good and it's like eight episodes. I love it. If that were a real show, I would watch that for eight seasons. I would get so obsessed with it like The Office. And I think it's because it has comforting coworker energy. And for those of you who don't know what the show is, it's basically a, it's filmed like a mockumentary with the asides and the confessionals and like the slow zooms. It's filmed just like The Office, but obviously, as you can probably surmise from the context clues, it takes place filming people who have jury duty for a week to two weeks, but only one person isn't an actor and he does not know that everybody else is an actor. So everyone's playing a character. They're playing like these regular people that have been called in to serve on the jury. And he thinks that he has also been called to serve on the jury. And they're filming this court case for some kind of documentary about the judicial system. But everything is scripted loosely except for his role in it. So it's, it's really interesting and I haven't got to the end of it. I think I saw something on the news before I really cared about the show where he did not handle it well when he found out that everybody was an actor except for him. So we'll see. But it's kind of comforting. It's kind of nice just to watch. And it reminds me of whenever I used to work with coworkers where you have like nothing in common except for your job, but somehow they're the best friends that you can ever make. Anyways, obsessing over that. Recommending. Hmm. Recommending. Man, I really should have prepared this beforehand. Rem- Yeah, we're just going to skip that one. I have no recommendations at this time, except for all the things I'm going to recommend that you do later in the episode based on the questions that you asked for my advice on. So my recommendation is to listen to my advice. Thank you. Um, Treating myself, obviously, to a Monstera. Lots of espresso, lots of caffeine. Life is so good. One more thing to talk about before I get into the actual advice, but this is still, um, it's more topic driven. And I wanted to do a full episode about this, but I just don't think that it would be very, um, it would be a shorter episode. So I'm just going to talk about it within this episode. So for me, I've been struggling with content consumption lately, and it made me think about what that means on a larger scale as far as social media. Let me explain. Content consumption for me is usually whenever I'm getting ready in the morning, I love to watch YouTube. I scroll TikTok here and there. I try to save it for like little breaks if I'm in a long line or I don't know if I have like a short time period where I'm waiting on something, but I can't do anything else. So I'm not losing out on time, but I'm kind of passing more time. Think like the DMV or if you're in line for a coffee or something, that's whenever I try and get on TikTok. Obviously it's not contained to that because I'm just a person, but that's whenever I try to consume my content. So I'm more mindful with it because it can definitely suck you into a timeless vortex. And next thing you know, three hours have passed and you are older and you can never get the time back. But 
I watch a lot of like female YouTubers. I watch the canceled podcast. I watch um, a lot of things on TMG network. <laughs> you can probably see where I'm going with this. I watch Brittany Broski a lot. Just, I used to watch BFFs. I got kind of sick of the whole like celebrity gossip thing. It wasn't really for me. And I watch just a lot of video podcasts when I'm getting ready. They're longer form. So it definitely helps me pass my time whenever I'm really taking my sweet time getting ready. Um, but I'll listen to things in the car, all that. Alex Earl, I listen to her podcast. But even before half those people got canceled, which I will kind of dive into, I guess, I just had felt like it was getting stale. And part of it is because I think a lot of the influencer scene is so repetitive. And we've seen this cycle over and over. If you're of my rough generation, <laughs> I'm 25, then we've seen people from Jenna Marbles and Jaclyn Hill kind of cycle through the entire lifespan of an influencer, someone who finds their their career solely from the internet. We've seen Emma Chamberlain kind of grow up and find her groove and so many people like them. But and I missed the whole like Bethany Moda, um, who's the other girl? The girls from Pretty Basic, Alicia and Remy. I wasn't really on their train, but I know exactly who they are. I just feel like it's been such a weird cultural shift because now you know what the influencer formula is like they blow up on a platform you switch to YouTube you start having vlogs and then you watch these things and it's the same thing every day like they get up and they go get a, a coffee and they drive to Air One and they get their food and then they have a shoe and then it's like a meet and greet and it's not that it's boring but I think it's so it's been done so many times before and we're looking into the snow globe of a world which is their world but it's also so distant from us it almost feels like the same setting the same plot line that's been done before and not to say that they should shift their entire lifestyle based on what's entertaining to the viewer but I think as the viewer it's just losing some of its luster so I had been kind of pulling back from that for a while and some things are interesting you know Alex Earl has a little bit different formula because she's not an LA based influencer but a lot of that content it's kind of mindless you know you don't think too much about it you're watching it as you get ready or you're watching it as you cook or something else it just not had the same appeal for me for a long time and fast forward to now you know a lot of those girls and Cody Co have been facing some hot water for things that they've done or said. So those also have been kind of taken out of my rotation just because of that. And even when someone is canceled for reasons that are a hundred percent justifiable, it still is so disappointing. You know, you, you really like to watch these people and you have so many comfortable memories associated with them and you share so many meals with them. And as silly as that sounds, you know, you watch the same people and you listen to them and you develop this parasocial relationship. So whenever they do something disappointing, then it almost feels like a, a letdown from a friend and that's not something that we should project on them because we put people on a pedestal. We can't be disappointed when they disappoint us. But there's something human about, you know, you really care about somebody or you enjoy watching them and then they let you down. So they are people too. So we can't expect perfection from everybody. But sometimes it is just sad to see, you know, parts of people's character that you didn't anticipate or didn't expect. And all of that to say, there's all of these reasons that I feel like I've not enjoyed consuming influencer based content. And kind of adjacent to that, I feel like social media as a whole has shifted because there's so many people who want to be creators, not consumers. And I'm guilty of that too. I obviously love to podcast. I love to create content. I love to do these things. But it's very difficult whenever everyone is creating content because there's no one left to consume it. So your things don't perform as well. And there's not really as much to consume because a lot of people are following the same formulas for the same goal to kind of blow up. And it just felt very stale to me. So I don't know. I think that I've been looking for new things to watch. And I, I'm i almost looking for like really normal vloggers, people who just have a basic life, like even go to their nine to five. If you have any recommendations, let me know. But it just not had the same, I don't know, the same flavor for me. I've been watching a lot of Emma Chamberlain's old vlogs with her old editing style because her new one is good, but it's very visual. So you can't really like listen to that whenever you get ready. It's very cinematic and, and beautiful and artistic and stylized and I love her so much, but it's difficult to watch while I'm trying to do mascara. So I like to listen to her older vlogs because you can kind of follow along just audibly. But if you have any recommendations, let me know. I feel like I've just been kind of burnt down on all of that. And I do treasure my getting ready time on YouTube. So as trivial as that sounds, I just feel like there's a, a tide turning. And I'm curious to see what the shift ends up being with us being a culture that's so heavily enamored with watching other people live their life. Like there's kind of this voyeuristic desire to just watch people exist and I don't know I think that we've kind of maxed that out so unless we have a whole new wave of people that everyone just likes to watch I think it's going to shift majorly but I don't know anything <laughs> so maybe that's completely off base but 
Let's move along. Questions and advice. Let me take a coffee break. So I've done these advice episodes dating way back to when Brie and I first started. I try and do one every 25-ish episodes. So basically twice a year, maybe. But I think I think a few of them have been a little bit um, more spaced out, unfortunately. But we're due for another one. The last advice episode that I did was episode 61, which I could have sworn was just like last month. It was not. It has been like 35 weeks. So I posted a question box. I got a lot of really good questions. Some of them were along the same line. So I tried to pare them down and make them into some questions that could be answered by the same spiel of mine for the sake of your time. Because I don't think that everybody has like a two hour drive that they're trying to kill by listening to me. If you do, I will pray for you. First question. How do you deal with burnout slash brain fog? Do you find it hard to find time to let yourself relax slash rest? What a wonderful question. Yes, I do. So dealing with brain fog and burnout, and for those who don't have a clear explanation of what that is, brain fog is just whenever you kind of feel literally like you're in a daze, in a fog. You can't think very clearly. You can't make a decision. You're kind of just, you feel zoned out. It's really hard to focus. It's really hard to motivate yourself. You just kind of feel like you're in this misty in between. And Burnout is obviously whenever you've hit a point either due to overexertion or depression, any other extenuating circumstance that has caused you to, to hit this, where you just don't have the motivation to go the same speed or to, to dedicate yourself like you had been previously. So you almost just lose all your motivation. And that's very difficult, especially whenever you work in a field like I do that you had previously loved or you have loved for a long time and you you know <laughs> see that love going away and that's very sad. But for me, burnout has always either come from depression, kind of sad seasons, or overworking myself. And I've been pretty open about how I feel like I really overdid last year. And I was, I'm was i so proud of what I accomplished last year. It was my best year of my business by far. I'm definitely not going to hit those numbers again, but that's by design because I want to have some sanity left, ideally. But I really threw myself into everything. I was working so hard. I was traveling. I was just taking on every single project that I could possibly get my hands on. And as a result, I got very burnt out towards the end of the year. And that combined with the difficult season that I was going through, it just really made me hit a deep, deep phase of burnout where nothing seemed like it mattered. I didn't have any motivation because of my emotional state to start working. Everything felt like it was so trivial, but I also just had a very difficult time finding any shred of motivation left because I felt like I'd used all of it. So that has been difficult to come back from. And I don't want to say that I've wholeheartedly conquered it because I still know that I'm not in that same stage. I think that that phase of burnout that I had gotten to, I think that that will be very enduring. Like I don't know that I will ever get back to the same level of motivation, but again, that's multifaceted because sometimes whenever you kind of hit that point that you aspire to get to, you don't need to go back to it. So the goal, remember, is not always to get back to the level that you were at. Sometimes it's finding the new level that's your new best or finding a new goal or a new direction to go full steam ahead down. But I think that for me, Understanding that everything comes and goes is very crucial. And I've said this in every situation that I can possibly bring it in. Seasonal depression, um, phases of lack of activity, bad diet phases, everything comes and goes. So understanding that brain fog and burnout are phases, just like most emotions. So having brain fog doesn't mean that your brain is broken. Being burnt out doesn't mean that you will never be on fire for anything again. It's just a temporary state of being. And before I hit my my big burnout then I had definitely gone through phases of being like, I can't do this. Like I'm out of ideas. I don't know what to do. I'm out of motivation. So waiting it out sometimes is the only thing that you can do. And understanding that, you know, for this month period or this few week period or whatever it is, you can't give your best and that's okay. Give your best for that day. Do what you can do. Make your to-do list, pare it down to everything that you can, you can get done and that you need to get done and give yourself the, the permission and the grace to do the bare minimum until you feel like you want to give more again. So understanding that, One bad season does not mean that you're never going to have a good season again. Crucial. Also, you have to take the time to rest. And that could be mentally, that can be physically. If your goals are, you know, in the gym or or for a sport, if you don't take the time to let yourself recoup, you're never going to have the ability to go 100% again. So keep that in mind. That's also kind of cliche. But if you don't take the time, you're only going to be pushing yourself further towards burnout. And for me, I think I always thought that I can go 1000% indefinitely. And 
what you forget is that if you go a thousand percent all of the time, your body's going to force you to go 70% and then 60% and then 40% and then 10% and then 0%. So if you always keep pushing through everything and you don't take time to kind of make up that lost ground, whether it's with your creativity, like I said, with your emotional state, with your physical state, your body's going to force you to take a time out. And that's happened to me before where I genuinely will get sick because I've been pushing myself too hard in whatever capacity that is. But if you don't take the time for yourself consciously, something is going to sideline you because our bodies are not meant and our minds are not meant to go 1000% all the time and to be producing constantly. And if nothing else, the quality of your work will suffer. And that's never been something that I'm okay with. So if I have to take some time off and set some boundaries in order for my work to stay at the quality that I like it to be, then so be it. I have bullet points. I'm referring back to those. (laughs) Um, As far as letting myself rest, it is very difficult to let myself rest, but I think that all those things I just said equate to that as well as they do to burnout, but also realizing that not resting does not get you an award. (laughs) And there's something to be said about, again, culture rewards people, um, with some kind of praise for not sleeping and for getting up early and for hitting the gym and doing everything else. There's no award. There's no trophy. Like there's no superlatives at the end of your life where God and you know, the angels are going to hand you this plaque that says least amount of rest possible. Good for you. That's just not, there's no benefit to that unless it's something that, you know, if you're working hard in a short term to reach a goal, that's different. I've done that. Everybody's done that. But to give yourself no leeway to pump the brakes for your whole life, that's exhausting. And I think a lot of that, when I've been in phases where that feels like the only acceptable option for me, they've all come from places of inadequacy within myself. So if you feel like you can't rest, if you feel like you can't give anything less than your best, if you feel guilty for sitting down, if you feel like you can't take any time off, you have to ask yourself, why do I feel like good is not good enough? Why do I feel like I can't take time off? Do you project that onto other people? And if you see people skipping the gym or if you see people going on vacation, do you look at them and think they're so lazy, they're worthless, they're horrible? Because that's one thing. If you look at them and you don't think a thing of it, or even you feel envious of them for being able to take a vacation, then what is that saying about yourself? Why do you have this harsh judgment towards yourself whenever you don't even apply that to other people? And if you feel the first way where you're looking at everybody else and you're judging them for things that you wouldn't allow yourself to do, maybe there's some kind of a, like I said, a feeling of inadequacy where you don't think that you would be worthy if you allowed yourself to let off the gas. And I've definitely been there many times and I probably will cycle back through it again. But if there's something that you feel like you're not good enough for or not good enough in, that you have to give yourself inhuman expectations, then that's something that you really should evaluate because no one can, can do all of that. And sometimes it's a product of your raising. If people have made you feel like you have to be up early and stay up late and do all of these things in order to be valuable, then that's just not the truth. So your value comes from who you are as a person, not what you're doing, not how much of it you're doing, not how well you're doing it. So that's how I deal with burnout. (laughs) That's kind of a roundabout way to do it. But One thing that always helps me kind of bounce back from that is finding something else that fulfills me that's completely independent of what I've burnt out from. So if I'm burnt out from work, throwing myself into a new exercise routine can help. Like running was my big thing last year. And, you know, I got into reading. I've gotten into different things where it kind of gives you that fire back for life and reminds you that your your torch can still be lit even if it's not lit for the same things. And sometimes it's as simple as finding that passion again will reignite your passion for other things in your life even if it's not that one specific thing. So if you're burnt out of the gym, try and find your passion for a new movie series. Try and find your passion for hanging out with your friends. Join a life group, you know, enroll in a cooking class, find something to channel your energy into that will reignite that spark. And then in my experience, nine times out of 10, then it just continues to kind of burn through your life. So whenever you find that new thing where you're like, oh my gosh, life is worth living again. I'm having such a good time with this new book series. Then it spills over because you have that serotonin and you're happy and then you want to you know, live your days because you want to get to your reading and then it just, it just trickles and snowballs. So I think that finding something that is completely independent of what you burnt yourself out from is also a great way to get out of that rut. Next question. Not really a question, but bullet points. Setting boundaries, especially with people who love, who impact your mental health and trying to get them to go to therapy. You guys, that's tough. That is very difficult. Um, first of all, for those who had similar questions, my heart goes out to all of you guys. That's a very difficult situation to be in. I've been there before and I've probably also been the difficult person, but first you have to understand that you aren't responsible for what someone does or when they don't take care of themselves. Those things are not 
you're doing. They're not your fault and they're not your responsibility. You also can't fix someone who doesn't want to fix themselves. You can't love someone healthy. You can't love someone into wanting to love themselves. And the only thing that you can do is support people and encourage them and give them the advice and the direction and the help when they seek it to encourage them to take those steps for themselves. But even whenever you want something so bad for someone, if they don't want it for themselves, you can't will them into healing. You can't will them into being better. So if you're dealing with someone in your life that is taking a significant toll on your mental health, there's also no reason, there's no statute, there's nothing that says that you have to continue to sit there and get steamrolled and get disrespected and have your mental health severely you know, in disarray because this person isn't taking the steps to heal themselves. And of course, there's so many circumstances. There's things that, you know, people can have gotten themselves into a situation that's completely their doing where they're suffering at their own hand, or there are situations where people have just been dealt a really shitty hand in life and they've not been able to climb out of that. And their circumstances just keep beating them down. And that's a little bit more difficult to set a boundary in. But at the end of the day, you owe people respect, you know, you owe people empathy, but you don't owe them your undying suffering. So if somebody is not taking those steps for themselves, then I think that you're completely justified in stepping out of that path with them. And I would obviously advise saying those things and saying, I love you. I care about you so much. I want to help you, but this is not a place that I can live with you. This is starting to take a toll on my mental health and my workload and my family, because you still owe it to yourself to take care of yourself so that you can be that person for those who depend on you. And so on. But when someone is very close to you, that's not caring for yourself. It's so easy to get kind of caught in that slipstream and let them take you down with them. And there's also a difference between somebody who you're trying so passionately to help and somebody who is reaching out to you for help. So if you can look at somebody and see like, you're a mess, you need this help. You have this laundry list of problems. Let me help you. But they didn't really seek you out. It's very different than somebody coming to you and saying, I have a problem. I'm stuck. I'm sad. I don't know what to do. Can you please help me? Those are very different things. And sometimes the difference between you being able to help them and not is, is just their willingness. So if you're dealing with a person like that in your life, ask yourself, how do they feel about their problems? What are they doing to help themselves? And I'm not going to come on here like one of those Instagram coaches and be like, if someone's not going to help themselves, you can't help them cut them out of your life. Cause that's not the case either. Sometimes it's not cutting somebody out. That's the solution. It's just taking a step back. And for me, I'm a chronic fixer. And that's actually led to a lot of issues in my friendships because I always think like, oh, I know better. I can fix this for them. And that's not what everybody wants. So I've had to remind myself, you know, if you're always looking at somebody and thinking like, I could fix this, I can do this. And then you're meddling that can separate you two in the, in the relationship that can make them feel judged. That can cause you to feel like you're failing. If you don't fix the problem in their life, that really isn't yours to fix in the first place. So there's a lot of different avenues to approach that. Um, Try and lead them to therapy. That's something that they have to decide for themselves. If you force them into therapy and they're not ready to work on it, it's not going to be effective. Unfortunately, therapy is not one of those things where it's like you can just give somebody a an amoxicillin capsule and their infection will go away. They have to go and try and put the work in. Therapy will never work for somebody who just shows up to check it off their box. And if anything, that will make them jaded to the idea of therapy in the future because they'll go, not try, expect, well, maybe it'll fix me. And then without doing the work, it will not fix them. <laughs> So then they'll be like, I went to therapy and it never worked. Therapy doesn't work unless you do. So you have to be in that headspace whenever you attend in order to get anything out. So if you're forcing someone in your life to go to therapy or they're only going just to appease you, I would almost caution you to tell them just don't go until you're ready to go because then they just will not go in the future and that will not be good. <sighs> Ooh, this is a good one. <laughs> Me about a note that I wrote myself. Are they going through a difficult season or are they just a difficult person? Let me say it again. I hope that is as powerful to you guys as it was whenever I was like, ooh, that's a good note to put in. Are they a difficult person where they are prickly and they're, you know, have some spite and they are angry and they just don't want help and they think the world is out to get them and they don't want you to help them or they do want you to help them, but they don't want to take the help. They just want your attention and the control that comes with you kind of being at their beck and call because of their issues or are they going through a difficult season? Because I have so many friends that are going through difficult seasons right now that just need extra TLC, that need extra love, that need to cry, that are feeling messy, that are feeling all these things. And that's a completely different situation than someone who is not necessarily in a difficult situation. They might have been previously, but they've refused to carry on with their life. They've refused to grow from that. They've refused to take any kind of help or advice. So 
this person that you love so much, are they difficult or is this season difficult? Because you can, you can love someone extra hard for a season to help them get through it. But if they're just somebody who refuses to see the sunshine, you can't make that, you can't part the clouds for them. So I hope that helps in any capacity, but if you're that difficult person too, and you see people trying to help you, you have to remind yourself that if you continually try and keep people coming back to you to help you, because I've, I've been in that place before where your love language is almost like wanting people to want to save you. And all that does is make your relationship a drain on the people that you love. So if you don't feel like you're worth helping or you're worth saving, or you don't feel like you are worth going to therapy and doing the work, are the people that you love worth it? Because ultimately your pain will take a toll on those who are around you and who care about you. So if you're the difficult person in question, maybe that's a hard thing that you have to look in the mirror and and say, like you might not think that you're worth fixing for your own sake, but are you worth healing and fixing for the sake of those who love you? I don't know. Maybe, maybe so. Okay. Dealing with difficult people slash not being intimidated by people who are generally off-putting towards you as a young female. Okay. Let's get into that one. So let's break it down first. Difficult people are everywhere. Difficult people can be difficult because like we just said of a circumstance, because of who they are, because they're having a bad day. Difficult people can be your husband. It can be somebody that you encounter once at a coffee shop. It can be somebody that you're working with as a client. Difficult people are everywhere. The first thing that I think that you should remember is that people's treatment of you is not a reflection of you. It's a reflection of them. And even if someone is treating you a certain way because of how they perceive you, listen to the statement. That's how they perceive you. It's not because of how you are. And even if that's how it's been made to feel towards you is that, you know, you're being treated a certain way because you're this, you're that, you're too young, you're female, you're a mom, you're not a mom, whatever else. That has nothing to do with you. That has to do with their perception of you, with their relationship to the categories that you fall into, but it's not you. And it doesn't take away or determine your worth because someone is off-putting towards you or is being difficult in your direction. So it has more to do with their relationship to themselves. And for some reason, the first thing that came to my mind was there were a few situations that I've had where, and this is very sad because I love women, but I've had situations with older women specifically in different points in my life where I've been treated not great in a professional setting by someone that I thought was going to have my back and someone that was, you know, a a career woman, someone that I even looked up to. And sometimes you'll get the brunt of the distaste or the backhanded comments or, and you know, us women, we know how to cut deep. So it can be a little, a little painful, but all this to say at the time, I'd be like, screw her. She's so mean. Like, you know, you think all these mean things about this person because they're rude to you first, but now getting older, I can look at these situations and think, okay, let's look at this woman. She's had this career for so long. She is dealing with a husband who isn't helping her at all at home. Her kids are probably mean to her. The house is probably a mess. She's looking at somebody who's 20 years her junior. And not that I, I'm not trying to sound like I'm over here just, I was such a bombshell because I wasn't. But whenever you're in that stage where you're in your forties and fifties and your whole life has been kind of hold away from you because your kids need so much and your career needs so much and the family dog needs so much and then your parents are sick and looking back on these women that I knew it's so easy to look at somebody who's 19 and 20 who can still eat 1800 calories a meal and not gain any weight and somebody who can go out in the evenings and can date around and it doesn't really matter and there's nobody nagging them and they're not nagging anybody else and they just haven't kind of been jaded by life yet it would be so easy to look at them and just give them a double bird and be like screw you I don't want to be around you so now with hindsight, I can look back at the situations and think like that had nothing to do with them that like, or with me, it was their life circumstance that made them resentful towards me. And I hope that I don't get to that point. I would hope that even if I am, you know, in that stage of life where my kids are smelly and my house is messy and the dog is peeing on the carpet and my husband is, you know, whatever else, I would hope that I can still find kindness in my soul, but it is difficult, you know, and it's hard to not resent other people for things that they have that you don't. So That was for some reason, and that's not even something that weighs heavily on my mind, something that popped into my head whenever I was writing these notes, because that is a perfect example of how much my situation has changed, in my opinion, towards that individual. And even though I've not replaced her in that life stage, with just the time that's passed and and being married now and being a little bit older, I can be like, oh, that did not have anything to do with me. And I should not have taken that personally. And I probably judged her too harshly because I didn't understand what she was going through. So I think having empathy for difficult people is difficult, but that really has helped set me free over the years. And remembering that 
you know, I'm like a broken record whenever I say this, but people don't do things to you as much as they do things for themselves. So if someone's being difficult towards you or prickly or just generally being off-putting towards you, most of the time it's not something that they're saying to slight you or doing to slight you. It might be, but they're doing things for themselves. They might be, you know, trying to get ahead of you professionally. They might be trying to progress past you in the gym. They might be trying to surpass you in Instagram followers. I don't know what the situation is, but they're not doing it because they want to see you fail as much as they just want to see themselves succeed. So taking the personal slight out of it and being like, they're just that way. They're that way to anyone who's in my spot. That's, (laughs) that's the case. I mean, think about baseball. Let me try and get a sports analogy in here. The one that I'm going to do per year. Okay. So in baseball, The pitcher is going to try and strike out whoever is in the batter's box because that's just their job. That's their role. It doesn't matter who you are. If you went up to try and, you know, hit a home run and they're trying to strike you out, they're throwing their best stuff. And you're like, what the heck? Why were you, why were you throwing 98 at me? That's crazy. That's just, that's just their role. That's who they are. That's their job. You could replace any person, any team, any individual in that batter's box. They're still going to try and get you out. Hopefully that gets across the message I'm trying to say. Difficult people are going to be throwing 98 at whoever is in the batter's box. If you're in there, just remember, the next person's going to come up and get the exact same treatment. It's not like the next person comes up and they're throwing slow pitches in there for you to hit a grand slam, you know? Yeah, I'm so sporty. (laughs) Hopefully that would (laughs) convey the message, but um, let me see. Let's dive into the young female part because it's a whole other, a whole other genre that we need to get into. So I assume this has something to do with your professional life just because I mean, I guess it could be personal, but I I don't feel like I've ever had as much judgment towards me as a young female in my personal life as I would in my professional life. Um, I think people can misjudge and mischaracterize young women and refuse to take them seriously in a professional setting just because even now in, you know, the year 2024, lots of professional industries have heavily been dominated by men for so long that that's just kind of how we characterize a successful individual and I'm not going to get into like internalized misogyny and all these things because I'm not a sociologist okay I've just spoken previously about my experiences because I worked in commercial lending which is again a very male centric field and we tend to think you know most CEOs most presidents that I've I've met and granted we're in the midwest are men they're middle-aged men a lot of men that have positions of power are much older than me And to be fair, I've never seen someone who's in their low 20s be in those positions, partly because it just takes a lot of time and and career growth to get there. But so it's easy to to have the pillar of success look like just a middle aged man. So, of course, when people see the antithesis, i.e. a young female, they're going to think that person's not qualified because just demographically, you look like the antithesis to what success has previously always been. So that's just a societal thing. That's not something against you. That's just the truth. So. Unfortunately, it does leave you with an uphill battle to try and prove yourself. But one thing that I've had to learn is if I'm comparing myself to this character, this middle-aged man who's very good at STEM, math, science, numbers, all these things, who puffs his chest out and can walk into any room and do all these things, if I'm comparing myself to him, I'm always going to feel like I'm falling short because I'm trying to stack up my strengths to his strengths and they're just not going to be the same ones. So rather than trying to emulate what this person is good at and what they're, what makes them who they are. Why don't I focus on what makes me who I am? Is it charisma? Is it the fact that I can be funny and lighthearted? Is it the fact that I know so much about the digital landscape when they might not? Is it my ability to work longer hours or to pivot or to be empathetic and to really connect with people? So focus more on what your strengths are versus what you're lacking in comparison to someone else. And for me, as soon as I started to switch that whole mentality, it really just opened so many more doors for me because at the beginning, even of my social media journey, I was trying to emulate these strong, very serious, very to the point businessmen. And that is just not me. Unfortunately, I'm not Harvey Specter as much as I would love to be him. So whenever I stopped trying to emulate them and started to lean into my own strengths, that's whenever I started to get hired by clients who really aligned with my values, who sought me out, who wanted to work with me. And there's so much more longevity in them because you can only put on a front for so long before they realize that it's just a front. So if they want someone who's going to do their taxes efficiently and who's going to be able to, you know, drink beers and complain about their wife, great. Call someone else. 
for me, you know, I have, I want to hear about their kids. I want to hear about their daughter's dance recital. I want to talk to them. I want to make jokes. I want to be someone they look forward to seeing because it's not like a stuffy business meeting. So if I lean into my strengths, I think that I will find my corner of the market and not to say that I'm not still going to be looked down upon because as a young girl, people are always going to find a reason to think that I'm vapid, that I'm shallow, that I'm dingy, that I'm, you know, in any, any number of negative adjectives, they're going to find a way to associate those with me just because they want to or because society has told them to. And to try and fight all of that and prove people wrong is going to create a whole different career path for me. So you have to separate yourself from just these inherent things that people will assume and misjudge about you and find out how to carve a path for yourself based on your strengths. I think I talked in a circle. Let me see. Okay. Also remember that everyone who you work with or encounter was at one point knew what they're doing. Every mom that says, oh, honey, you just wait. She was a new mom once. She was new and she was idealistic and she was hopeful and she had all of these things that she had yet to figure out. So every mom that shames you and says like, oh, you just wait or oh, I don't know why you're doing this. Don't let them make you feel bad because they were a new mom at some point too. They weren't always in their 40s and 50s and and had everything figured out. And newsflash, they're also raising their kids at that age for the first time. So somebody who's, again, ahead of them could look back and say, you're doing this wrong. So everyone in your, in your workplace was the youngest person there at some point. They were the newest person at some point. They were learning everything. So no one just walks in and goes straight to CEO. So you have to remember that everyone who's shaming you for this is being so hypocritical because they're looking down on you for a role that they once had. Enough said. Next, you owe someone initial respect but you do not owe them unquestioning loyalty or allowing yourself to get walked on. I hope that makes sense. I think that you owe someone respect across the board. When you first meet someone, when you don't know them, you owe them your respect, you owe them a chance, you owe them kindness. It's up to them and how they treat you whether you continue to owe that to them. I don't think that you owe someone anything that they're not going to respond to you with. So if you treat someone with respect, they don't respond back to you, that's up to you how you want to handle it. I try to always maintain this air of respect, but if somebody doesn't respect my time, I'm not going to make extra time for them. If somebody doesn't speak to me kindly, I'm not going to, you know, use extra sunshine and rainbows whenever I speak to them. And for my own sake and my own desire to be a positive influence on people's lives, I try to always be kind and to always be respectful, but I can be kind of respectful in my own lane, in my own life and not affiliate with them. So I know that can be different whenever you're not self-employed and you don't have the luxury of kind of cherry picking who you want to work with, but Remember that you have choices and just because somebody is in a position of authority does not mean that they're better than you. does not mean that they can speak to you in a cruel manner. And I would say 10 times out of 10, it's worth exploring other options to keep yourself out of that situation. But I also know that that's not always um, financially feasible. So is there anything that I didn't answer? Let me see. Oh yes. And more advice. <laughs> um, another thing to, to help you not be intimidated by by these people who kind of look down their nose at you is to continue to put yourself in situations that challenge you to make you grow and make you want to be more out of your comfort zone. I can't tell you guys how many rooms that I walked into where I was like, I'm the only 18 year old here. I'm the only 19 year old here. Even now I'm the only 25 year old here. And I probably now I feel a little bit better because I at least feel confident in my own career and what I've built, but I still have to walk in and say, Oh, I do social media. And that's not always met with a lot of respect. So to walk into a room and be able to go up to people and shake hands and to stand up straight and to not be on your phone. Those are all such lost skills. And I think that I can lean into the Gen Z, silly Instagram posts, LOL, whatever, as much as I want to. But I think that you can't, you can't undervalue being able to walk into a room and carry yourself well. So for me, I found so much benefit from volunteering and being on nonprofit boards because you're always with people that have made advances in their careers who are in a position where they can donate either their time or their money or both. So most of the time I'm surrounded by people who are in positions that I want to be in and that always challenges me and makes me feel more equipped. So even if I walk into a room feeling like I don't deserve to be here, I'm probably the least wealthy, the least educated, the least smart, the least successful, whatever it is, if I walk into that room, I'm still in that room. So that has helped me learn for one that I deserve to be there as much as those people, but also understand that everyone in that room is second guessing themselves. The more that I meet clients and meet these successful business owners, people who own country clubs and people who have beautiful families and people who have done all of these things that I hope to do one day, the more I meet them and and speak with them, they're just people too. And they're still figuring it out. So 
the more you can interact with your role models and, and get mentorship. And, and you guys met Tatiana, who I love and adore so much, but she's very open to me about her struggles and about things that she has second guessed herself on in her career and her shortcomings and failures. And, and she's an amazing, accomplished, well-spoken individual. So kind of taking these people off of a pedestal and realizing that they're just humans. Most of the time it makes me put them back on the pedestal because I can see how they overcome things. But just remembering everybody has been where you are. So don't let them talk down to you. And if they're going to waste their energy thinking that you shouldn't be in that room, they can be mad because you're still in that room. So I could do a whole episode probably about that. Okay. I'm going to try and speed through this one because we're looking at an hour here. How did I know I was ready to get married? And at what point did I feel like I was ready to commit to someone for the rest of my life? Let me preface this and say, I got married at 22. Granted, I turned 23 in 18 days, but that is still a fetus age now that I look back on it. So for me, I always knew that I wanted to get married. Spoiler alert, I live in the Midwest. Of course, that's what I wanted to do. But it was never like my end all be all. I'm going to get married, have a beautiful white wedding um, and so on. Sorry, I need coffee. I'm starting to fade away. My life force is leaving me. Anywho, it was never like my crowning achievement. I had it been adjacent to my crowning achievements. And I don't know, I've talked about this in the past. Go listen to my episode with my husband if you want to listen to my full love story. But I was not looking to date whenever I met him. I was like fresh off of three or four people that I was like trying to have a relationship with or, you know, you go on a couple dates with and you're like, oh my gosh, like, is there any hope for the human race at all? No. So after several failed like talking stages and a bad breakup and all these things, I was like, listen, I'm done. This is, this is fine. I can date myself. I can have a career. I can do all these things. I'm done. Spoiler. I met Austin the next month. So I was not looking to get married. I wasn't looking to have something that was going to be a forever thing. I was looking for happiness in myself and he came into my life and it was very quickly apparent how he was not looking to goof off. He's like, I'm not wasting time. Okay. I want to lock this down in an appropriate time window if this is right for you. And I knew his intentions from the start. So it wasn't something that I had to guess on. And he wasn't trying to rush anything. He wasn't saying like, let's get married tomorrow. It was obviously down the road that he was intending to do all of that, but he just wanted to make it clear that if I didn't have the same goals, then we shouldn't pursue a relationship because it just gets complicated. And I liked that from the beginning that he was very upfront because that's just very contradictory to how most boys approach dating. So I loved how he made me feel just like I was enough, exactly how I was. And at this point, I was still working as a credit analyst. I had horrible, horrible acne. I was paying off debt. Like I just did not feel like I had it going on. So I had struggled with some like disordered eating and I was all over the freaking map. I was not doing well. And he made me feel like all of that was fine. Like he never made me feel ashamed for my skin or for my weight that was up and down. He never made me feel shame for my career, not really being anything special. And of course I was proud of it at the time, but it wasn't like, it wasn't a defining characteristic necessarily. So all of these things, he made me feel like I was enough, but he also made me want to be so much better because of how I felt for him. And he made me feel so safe and so loved and just supported that I was like, I want to bring him the moon. Like I will, I will single-handedly climb up the sky and get the moon and bring it back to him because I love him so much. He made me want to pay off debt. He made me want to get healthy. He made me want to heal my skin more than I actually wanted to for myself. He made me want to just be better overall because of how good he was to me and how kind he was to me and how he didn't expect or want anything from me that wasn't just me. So that's how I knew I wanted to marry him. <laughs> I can't speak to how I knew I was ready to get married because I don't think it's something that you just get ready for in life. I think it's something that you realize that you want with the right person. And if you go into life and you hit, you know, 23, 24, 27, 35, whatever, and all of a sudden this light bulb comes on and you're like, oh, I think I'm ready to get married. It's not that. That's not how you should be approaching it. It's with that person. So you might really want to get married. You might really want to move forward. You might really want a wedding, but you won't know that you're ready to get married until you're facing that situation with that person. Because if you'd have asked me, I would have said that I saw myself getting married until I was in my upper 20s. But when I met him and I was like, had just turned 20, it was very quickly apparent that I was like, this is who I want a future with. I want to feel like this all the time, feel safe and feel affirmed and feel loved and validated. And that's who I want to build a life with. So when you find the right person and you're both aligned with, you know, the important pillars <laughs> of life, if you have the same viewpoints on enough, then I think you move towards making that decision. So we still were dating for a year and a half and then we got engaged and had a year engagement and then we got married. 
And I will say that marriage is easier than I expected. But we did a lot of things to prepare for marriage. I don't think you ever can definitively know that you are ready for marriage. But what you can do is set yourself up for success. And this might be controversial, but I think that marriage is still strategic. You still choose who you marry. So you do fall in love. I think that you can control the situations that you put yourself in to decide if you are going to fall for someone who's good for you or bad for you. And we all know that we've dated people before that you're like, oh, I don't know, I shouldn't really pursue this. And then you do, and then you get feelings for them. And then you think, well, I already like them, so I don't know. Why did I put myself in that situation in the first place? I could have predicted how that would go. So it's so much easier from the beginning to look at the situation objectively and say, that's not going to end up in a place that I want to be. So I'm not even going to put myself in the position to have to make a difficult emotional choice. I'm just not going to catch feelings in the first place. So divert yourself. But with Austin specifically, we had the same goals. We have the same religious beliefs. We have the same desire to have a family. We have the same goals for our life. So that already lined up. But I think that we did a lot of things very intentionally to give ourselves a good jumping off point to reduce the need to fight in the future. So I paid off all my debt before we got married because I did not want to have anything hindering us whenever we first started dating. So I just cut back on all my spending. I moved back in with my parents. I, I humbled myself and I paid off my car and I paid off my student debt and I just did nothing except for work and pay off my stuff because I didn't want to carry that into our marriage. Austin didn't have any debt. He was working hard on his career. He was working hard on just, you know, being a good person. <laughs> Very helpful. But we both were working on separating anything that could make our lives difficult. We did do premarital counseling through our church. Um, I love our church, but I honestly feel like everything that we talked about in counseling, we had already talked about previously. We had lots of hard conversations. We talked about everything that seems like it's overkill at the beginning, talking about parenting, talking about do you plan to stay home with kids or do you not? Do you plan to have a career? Or do you not? How, how much money do you see us spending? How, how much do you see us traveling? What are, you know, how, literally everything. So all of these different situations that we've seen either our parents struggle with, or we've seen other couples struggle with, we talked about all of it and we almost like duked it out beforehand. Like we thought about these things and, and every single time you have to decide, like, is this something that one of us can compromise on? Can we meet in the middle or will this be a fight for the rest of our lives? And there are some things like Austin loves a cluttered vanity. He loves to have all his stuff in sight on the vanity. He's probably not going to change. I'm so averse to that and minimalistic. I hate it. It drives me crazy. But can I live with it the rest of my life? Yes. If there were something else where we conflicted, like on our spending habits or our saving habits, where you're faced with literally in marriage, you, one of you has to move or both of you are going to have to disagree for the rest of time. And if it's something that doesn't really affect your day to day, you can look the other direction and it's fine. You just kind of are like, well, I can tolerate it. That's okay. But you have to find those things early on. So I think that we did a lot to set ourselves up for success before we got married because, and we always joke about how we're so clinical with it. <laughs> like we, we almost treated marriage like a strategic alliance. Like we have these unique strengths, these skills, the same goal. If we team up, we can achieve them together, which like I said, it sounds like what in the game of Thrones, like what are we doing here? But you really have to have, it's like love is not enough at the end of the day. And like I said, that might not be popular, but love alone is not enough to carry you through a marriage in a lifetime because your love will evolve. Your love will change. Your love will even diminish if you don't take care of it. So it really is someone that you want to work hard for and that you want to be a partner with and that you want to team up with. And I feel so passionately about this because even on days that Austin and I don't necessarily like show a lot of affection or show like a lot of lovey-dovey feelings, I love teaming up with him. I love being his partner. I love working towards goals with him. I love having every single boring conversation with him. I love signing tax forms with him and I hate signing tax forms. So I just love doing life with him. And I think that's what you need in a partner. And that's something that I feel so fortunate to have found. But even if Austin and I somewhere down the road lost every bit of physical attraction, if we lost every bit of romantic love, if we lost every bit of chemistry, I would still want to live life with him. I would still want to be his partner. I still love talking to him he's just my best friend. I just love being around him. And I still love that we align on so many things. So I don't know, like I said, I'm not, and we both know, like we talked about in our episode together, we don't believe in soulmates. I believe in choosing each other every single day. And that's almost more romantic. If you, if you feel like the stars have just appointed you to this person, you're going to be under this illusion that you should always have sunshine and rainbows, that things should always be good. And that's not how life is. So I think it's almost more romantic that two imperfect people that don't fit perfectly together that are going to fight and clash continue to wake up and choose each other. That's a thousand percent better than the universe just saying like, oh, you guys are two halves of the same whole because you'll be so disappointed if you enter into a union thinking that that's the case and then you start fighting and you're like, wait, 
are we not soulmates? I thought this was supposed to be perfect. Like, I don't know. I digress. Um, I had one more point with that. Let me, oh yes. Um, I just said this basically, but it's not like a choice one day. Cause the question said, at what point did you know you were ready to commit to someone for the rest of your life? It's not like a decision that I made one time when I said yes to Austin when I was 21. It's not when if we talked about marriage, it's not when he asked my parents, it wasn't any of those things. The decision is daily. It's almost hourly. Like I make the decision to speak kindly whenever I am not feeling very kind or have had a rough day. I make the decision to think about him first. I make the decision to do what's best for the marriage and for a household. And that sounds so like, I am going to do what's best for the union, whatever. It's not that, but you truly like every tiny, tiny decision you make impacts your marriage. So you have to choose that all the time. And I'm not an expert guys. My third anniversary is coming up. Okay. I don't know what I'm talking about, but for us, that's, there's never a point that you just decide. And then you're in marriage mode the rest of your life, because you don't change when you get married. You don't, you're not a different person from like before you sign your certificate to afterwards, you're still the same self-centered individual, or at least I was. So you have to choose every day to want to have a healthy marriage and have a happy marriage and to do things with them in, in consideration. And like I said, marriage has been easier than I thought because everyone kind of acts like, oh, it's so difficult. But I don't struggle to choose him. I don't struggle to want to make him happy because I love him. So life hack, love your husband. But I think that there's never a point that you just know and then it's never hard again. I think that you can have that moment with a person where like, oh, I really want a life with them. But that doesn't eliminate the need to work hard and to, to really focus on growing your relationship. Last question. Um, how do you and Austin approach studying the Bible slash praying together? Full disclosure, we could be better. We love independent Bible study. We love studying things on our own. We both have our separate Bibles and our separate plans and our separate journals. Um, sometimes we'll do it adjacent to each other. And the one thing that has helped us grow as a couple, as sad as it is, is dealing with our fertility journey and the miscarriage. That's what really catapulted us from separate praying and separate studying the Bible to doing it together. We go to church together every week. That's like the bare minimum, I feel like. So we could definitely be better. Um, even sometimes if you don't want to discuss it because we, I don't know, it just it, my relationship with God is very personal and I don't always love discussing what I feel like God is teaching me with everyone, except for you guys, obviously. But I think understanding that you can both have a different relationship with God and Austin's never going to sit down and journal for an hour and a half like I might, but his prayer time might be completely separate when he's out in a walk and, and understanding that we're on the same page with our faith and all of that has been so incredibly helpful. But as sad as it sounds, trials have made our faith and our marriage so much stronger. And I, even though I'm not thankful for the trials, I'm thankful for that. So that is not an answer that I feel like I gave complete justice to, but I do have to stop because I have a meeting in 15 minutes. So I have to leave, but I hope this has been helpful for everyone. I love you so very much. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions. And I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question, but I will do another advice episode. So thank you for listening. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the week. Treat yourself on Friday. Have all mountains, no valleys. Tune in next week. I love you so much. Bye.